الحمد لله الحمد لله وكفى وسلام على عباده الذين اصطفى اما بعد we started last week with the ghusl of mayyit which is washing the dead body now once we have got the initial bit sorted out closing the eyes covering the jaw trying to make sure that body is placed in the proper way then we get ready for washing a deceased or the dead body should be placed on the bench and that if possible the bench or the bed where we are washing the body on should be fumigated with the incense which is a scented compound we call it loban if you remember from back home some of you might have seen it uh it gives a sort of incense there a bit of fragrance and doing it in odd number is mustahab inshallah and then and you just go around it and then put the body in one of the two positions either you could put in such a way the feet are facing towards qibla means the head is obviously a little bit up would be looking towards qibla or to the the right side of the body is towards qibla so both ways fine whatever is convenient depending on the place where you are washing the body just go for that there's no big harm in any ways perfectly fine inshallah taala then we cover the private part which is from navel to knee min surati ila rukba for men and women both that is the most important part to be covered and we slowly take the clothing from underneath so it's not expose the body at all and then we do wudu we give them proper wudu uh the ritual ablution except that we do not put any water in the mouth or in the nostril because it would then be difficult to clear it and you do not want it to continue to leak from the side once they have been enshrouded those small kids who are not pubertal pre pubertal babies or boys and girls they do not need this wudu although it is preferred to do so if they if you didn't do it then it's okay as well again if the deceased person is in the state of sexual impurity for whatever reason then uh, they should get that nostril and mouth cleansed properly but again here even in this situation it's just uh, the 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 most correct view even within the hanafi school is that we do not do that now the current practice though is a sort of middle way which is wetting a piece of cloth a small amount you know a small piece of cloth wrapping it on your finger wetting it and then rub it on the in the mouth and small uh, cotton wick wet it and roll it in the nostrils so as if you have done a not gargle or rinsing the mouth but little bit in between so wet you have wetted the mouth and the nostril just to fulfill the essential or the obligatory rituals of ghusl so shar'i ghusl has three faraid as you recall from previous discussions to gargle to clean the nose i mean rinsing it and then covering the whole body with water washing the whole body with the water so the counterpart to that would be to wet it with a piece of cloth once the wudu is done we will use the sid which is low tree leaves or hurud whatever is available boom them and use it because it has got sort of more cleansing property 
it's like soap in the modern time but it is sunnah and mustahab to use lotr if you do, do not find it then plain water is fine as well actually but using soap we in the modern time use uh, shampoo soap anything everything is fine the head and the beard when washed and if possible to use khitmi there which is a plant which has some some fragrance to it it is good to use that then you tilt the body to the left side first so as to wash the right side before you wash the left side as the sunnah dictates and you pour water from head to toe in such a way that the bot the water reaches the other side all through from top down then the body is placed on its right side and similar action is done so you wash the left side from head to toe covering whole body with water washing it all through then you can dry the body hanut is a compound as well which could be placed on the head and the beard after drying it and the places that are touch that that touch the ground for sajda we put or we rub kafur which is camphor so the areas that touch are seven both palms nose forehead together is counted as one and then knees and toes or feet there's difference of opinion whether to put cotton to block the orifices front passage and back passage mouth ears and any of those orifices do we cover them the preferred view is you do not need to Imam Zayla he said there's no problem in doing so all the majority still consider that we shouldn't do one should not trim the nails shave the beard cut the hairs to make them look tidy or what that is not at all allowed it is actually makru tahrim and is close to haram because those are the action for the grooming worldly type you know self care which the dead person doesn't need he doesn't need to pose for any photograph or show how he looks he just going back to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so he doesn't need any of that the wife can wash the husband the reason being that they are still connected with their idda period so the husband passed away the wife is still connected she cannot marry a second husband for at least for, for four months and 10 days for that period is where she is in a way connected unlike men men hasn't got any relationship the the reason the, the minute she passed away becomes ajnabiya stranger in such a way that according to hanafi school it is not allowed for men to touch his wife obviously she would have many female members in the community or somewhere who could come and help them out the family members maybe to come and wash the body so why husband needs to do it and uh, even if there is no woman available then husband can do that yet he should put gloves on or something so as to not touch the body uncovered mubasharan like without any barrier the hadith of sayyida aisha and the life of sayyidina ali radhiyallahu ta'ala when he give ghusl sayyida fatima radhiyallahu ta'ala anha that is the evidence for other schools to allow men to do it however 
Sayyidina Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu had a special merit in this regard as he responded to Sayyidina Abdullah ibn Mas'ud when he said, how could you do that? It is not okay. So he did not say that it is okay. He said, yes, but Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa gave me the permission by saying that Fatima is with you in this world and in Jannah. Means she has got the relationship and will continue to be in your relationship with the, like, you know, as a husband and wife until Jannah. That is one explanation from the hadith that they still had the relationship as an ex exception. So that's a merit of Sayyidina Ali radiallahu ta'ala. Also, the Hanafis would explain this incident to say Sayyidina Ali was helping the family members, teaching them and telling them how to wash and then pouring water rather than actually giving ghusl which is fine as long as the body is covered. Now, if there are only men available and they're not mahram or husband, or who, then they, the, if the non-mahram are there and no one is there who is blood relative, then they, should, they can give tayammum for both sides. It's a possibility. So husband can do the tayammum as well for the wife. Now a slave, slave girl, slave lady, you know, the concubine, if she gives birth to a child from the, from the master, this slave girl is now called Ummu Walad. Ummu Walad means the mother of the baby baby of husband, well, not husband, master. So Ummul Walad. The hukum there is, the ruling there is, the minute husband passed away, that woman becomes a stranger for the husband. And that is why even she cannot do the ghusl for the husband. She is not connected in that regard. Obviously, if there was no one else, then that slave woman would be able to wrap a piece of cloth around her hand and purify the body or by just by doing the tayammum or one of the other ways. We mentioned it, men can do the tayammum, which is only hand and face and that's done. Again, when women are getting the tayammum done, or men are doing tayammum who are not related, non-mahrams, they must wrap their hand with some piece of cloth or something, a glove of some, some kind. However, if there is a mahram person available, then he can do tayammum to the deceased from the opposite gender without needing gloves or piece of cloth to cover their hand. Same applies to hermaphrodite. Those who, we call it khansa mushkila, khansa mushkil, means where there is no clear distinction whether the hermaphrodite is a male or a, female, or a female. He has got organs of both. Appearance could be this way or that way, so no one knows for sure. Or they have organs from both sides, so it's like a bit of confusing position. Because there are certain who have internal organ for female, outwardly they are male, and vice versa. For them, it's fine. They get the hukum of the outer appearance. But when it comes to those who do not have that clarity, in fact, they have both organs, then they are called hermaphrodite or khansa mushkila, means mushkil, which means that they cannot take ruling on either side. They're treated as though 
to be on safe side, you just have to just do the emblem for them. pre pivotal the boys or girls can be watched by anyone provided there's no fear of fitna, no lustful relationship or feel. Yeah. So if there's no such thing, which Alhamdulillah generally is not the case, then they can watch the young babies, boys, girls. Now kissing the forehead of the deceased person or even the face, as long as they're mahram and there's no problem with that. And it is actually the sunnah of Sayyidina Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He did that to Abdullah ibn uh, Usman ibn Mad'oon or Abdullah ibn Mad'oon, one of those. They were their cousins, Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's tribe. And uh, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa when he departed from the world, Sayyidina Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu anhu, he kissed the forehead of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa when he came back. Now, how do we enshroud kafan? First, it is the responsibility of the men to ensure that he provide for this all the necessities must be made up, must be provided for by the husband. That's the most correct view. And fatwa is upon this from Abu, Imam Abu Yusuf, Imam Muhammad's view is that this is not the responsibility of the husband. If someone is so poor and they haven't got money to enshroud the body, then people around are responsible like the family, so they should help them out. And if they can't do it, they don't, they can't afford, then the Baitul Mal council or government, if they don't do it, then the community who are aware and who have some knowledge about the family they should step up and help them out. If someone cannot afford, they are allowed to extend their hand to seek assistance, I mean they can ask for help from others, either for shrouding or burial or for both. A deceased person must be shrouded. You can't put them in the grave naked. Now, how many clothes should they have? Three for men, the best one, or sunnah, kafan, and five for women. So sunnah, which is the best, and then sufficient, and then something which is needed or necessary should be necessary actually so sunnah is for men it is a kameez which extend from the base of the neck to the feet izar which is the inner shroud a wrapper from head to feet and an outer wrapper, which is called lifafa. And it should be longer, up to an arm's length, a foot or something extra, in order to ensure that the sh after shrouding, it, can, it could be wrapped, it could be knotted right at the end, it could be tied at both ends while the body is being carried to the graveyard or to the masjid for janazah. It should be according to the standard of the person who died. So what they would normally wear on Eid or Friday. And what a woman would normally wear when she, after marriage, visits, visits the, the parents. 
obviously we shouldn't be extravagant. White is better, but not must. And uh, whatever is available, if we don't find anything else, just do in whatever color or whatever level. Sayyidina Abu Bakr Siddiq, radiallahu ta'ala an, he advises family to enshroud him in his usual clothing, his normal izar and his rida. He, he was not bothered. He said, said the new coffin would better be used by the living people, which suggests that even two sheets would be okay. Look at the sunnah. If all are available, all three, sufficient when you have just two of them, which is lifafa and the inner wrap, and uh, necessary is whatever covers the body just once, like in the one sheet from top bottom. The sufficient is izar and the lifafa. White and cotton, that's preferred. Yes, length should be, if possible, extra on both ends. There should be no sleeves. There should be no pockets, no openings. And we should not hem the edges. It's not show off. It's not that we're going somewhere special, special in a sense we're going to, but not to waste money on any of those extravagance and it's quite prevalent actually unfortunately to tie a turban on the deceit is generally disliked which is the most soundest of the views because Rasulullah didn't have it but some ulama has allowed it it's, it's makrut tanzihan according to some, but since others allow it, it should be okay. How do we shroud the dead body? First, we position on the bed or on the wherever plank you want to put the body on. Put the outer wrapper on the bench, then the inner wrapper on top of that, then Put the body in there and we normally put all three in order the lifafa at the bottom the inner wrap and then outer wrap and then you put the body on top in the lifafa you make a v-shaped neck area so that the head could be put through and through to that so when you put it it goes just over the body from the front with the opening is being cut. Head goes through it, the front sheet comes straight up. That's the amis. And then you fold the left side and then the right side on top of that. Left side comes this way, right goes onto the other way. And as I said, you should knot it right at the end on, from both sides so that it doesn't come off. For women, they have additional two clothes, two pieces of clothes. One is khirqa, which is a head veil, which covers the head and face if need be, but generally head. And a cloth that extends from the chest area to the belly button to cover the breasts. Some say it can extend from here to the knees, from the chest to the knees. Sufficient, uh, sufficient shroud for the uh, lady would be inner wrapper, which is izar, outer wrapper, lifafa, and khimar, which is the veil. Sorry, should be khimar, not khirka. Khirka is the chest one.
Okay. And sufficient number of women is izar and lifafa, and face veil or the head veil. Again, you make them wear the shirt first, which is kameez, then the hair are divided or parted in two sides, one on the right side, one on the left side, from all around, and you just put it on the chest, over the sheet, over the shirt, kameez. Then the veil is placed on the head and face, over the shirt, and then the breast cloth ties over the wrapper, outer wrapper, to avoid any potential exposure. So you have the shirt, the veil, outer inner wrapper, outer wrapper, and then breast tie. You put some perfume, which is from aloe vera or any other perfume, and perfume it a few times. Odd number is better. Okay, so that's how you shroud them. We cover the janazah prayer and burial next week, inshallah. Jazakallahu khairah. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi.